Did it go? Yeah, there it goes. There it goes. Looky there. It's live. Live. Jump right in. You're about to witness the strength of creep knowledge. My fellow Americans, fucking Pootie Tang is invading the ukulele. You know, Pootie Tang, he's a bad dude. Ah. God damn it. It's the end of the world. I'm fucking firmly convinced. I hope not. Old, no shirt. Putin on a fucking horse is going to fucking lead the charge into the Ukraine. <sighs> Just fucking no shirt on a horse in front of like a fucking barrage of Russian tanks. Just fucking shells going over his shoulder. I can see that shit happening. That crazy motherfucker. <sighs> Good evening. Welcome to the 40th Slip. This is episode 200. And three, the Russians are coming. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, as I read in the news, as I was gra gathering the the news for this evening, uh, I guess uh, looks like uh, old Putin's gonna invade the Ukraine. Uh, I don't know all the logistics about this fucking bullshit, so I'm not gonna sit here and try to tell you that I know which side's right and which side's wrong because I don't. <laughs> Certainly don't. <laughs> yeah. Not a, not a fucking clue. Nope. I don't know. I've heard conflicting ideas on both sides. I just don't have enough give a fuck to care anymore. So there's that. Uh, yeah, it's been another interesting week. It was fun having Steve on last week. Yeah, it was. Sure. I enjoyed that. Yeah, um, yeah. Steve's doing. Steve's doing well, and and as as he informed me, he enjoys not doing the show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't mind coming on every once in a while, but yeah, definitely enjoys having the time off from it. So, um, and I I get it. If I can completely get that. Uh, Chris Day is here. Evening, Chris. Haven't seen you in the fucking chat in a while. Um, uh, so I'm gonna, I'll start off with this tonight. Um, I made a few posts over the past couple of weeks on the page, um, because of the metrics through Facebook. Now, everybody needs to understand something. When I started that little campaign, hey, everybody, rah, 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 join me. Let's fucking try to make a, some noise. Try to get the fucking Facebook page back on track. Um, and I got not a lot. Like, I got a lot of response to the posts. But when I would look at the list of the people who liked the posts, I can see who's following the page. It will show me following, following, invited, because I always usually invite people to follow the page. Or invite. it'll say invite if I haven't invited them yet. And less than half of the people that had liked the post in which I said, please follow the page, were following the page. Now, that being said, when I look at my Facebook metrics, the, the, uh, my insight, what they call insights, into how I'm growing, my numbers of followers continually increase. As far as how many I'm gaining every 28 days. However, the total number of people continues to decrease. So I don't understand what is happening. The page doesn't get what it used to. And for those of you, especially Donnie, whatever the fuck your name was that I banned from the fucking page for being a complete fucking cunt. Um... It's not about me bitching. It's just, it was just was about me asking people for help and not seeing anything from it. 
And like I said to in my post, uh, I'm at the end of my rope with it. Like I, I, I'm, I'm liking doing the show again. I'm not going to stop doing that. Uh, whether or not it's on Facebook will be that. That's going to be the point of contention at this point. And I moved it to Facebook because Facebook was the bigger platform for me. And when I initially moved it, it worked. And then they cut my balls off and destroyed what the page was. The page used to be big. It used to get tons of comments, likes, shares, uh, what you name it. The page was insanely active. And now it's a shadow of its former self. And I don't know how to explain that to people. And people are like, well, you should just do it because you love it. Well, understand something. If I put fucking eight years of my life <clears throat> into something, like let's say I'm building a house and I work to build that fucking house and it's a mansion and I build a fucking mansion. And then after eight years, somebody comes in after I've built the mansion and says, ah, we're going to take all this away and just leave you with one room. And then I should sit, I should still be happy. That's what the people are like. You should just still be happy and just yeah, do that's this. That's a solid analogy. You should just be happy that they've taken away 95% of the house that you built. Just do it because you're happy. Well, the fact of the matter is that I'm not. I'm not happy with what they've done. I'm not happy that I can make a post saying that I'm pissed off and it gets more action than the daily posts that I make. I should just bitch all day long. I'd get more fucking shit on the page. You know, I, I, you ask people for very simple things, very simple things. If you like the page, if you love the page, if you enjoy coming here, which they all seem to say that they do. Please do these very simple things. And for the record, most of those people seem to be doing those things. Um, I don't know with the following thing. I don't at this point. I don't know if that's Facebook not fucking showing me things. Uh, with the way that the numbers keep going up yet going down, I don't know anymore. I don't know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah, Facebook I, as a whole has gone downhill a lot, and I definitely don't think you're the only victim of it. No, I, I, I literally had someone post on the post. My friend Bruce is going through the same thing. His numbers increase, show that he's increasing, but yet the total overall numbers show that he's decreasing. Yeah. It's fucking horrible <clears throat> uh chris day i think it's a lot a lot of it is people just want to listen they want to tune in but they don't want to have to jump hurdles uh, that jump hurdles for what <clears throat> the show goes on a fucking it's a podcast you can get it on any podcast platform any any fucking week it doesn't have to be here and just unless you want to catch the live show the live show's here <clears throat> um but the uh, the show, and when I'm done, it goes on YouTube. It goes on fucking uh, on Spotify, uh, Stitcher, fucking iTunes. You can get it anywhere, dude. Anywhere. <laughs> this is just where it streamed live, and it may go back to fucking YouTube because. Eh. Will Orth, is there going to be a war? No, I like your little uh, fucking Rod Serling picture there, though. Like that. I don't know if there's going to be a war. Fucking Pootie Tang. Ask Pootie Tang. Fucking send old fucking shirtless Pootie Tang a message. Ask him. Are you invading the Ukraine? I don't know. <laughs> Seems like a pretty pretty solid guy. And by that I mean fucking works out. Holy shit. <clears throat> it, if there's one fucking foreign leader... That could just like come in and like fucking UFC beat the shit out of all the other fucking <laughs> foreign leaders. It's Putin. Oh, for sure. Let's just, he would fucking wipe the floor with Xi Ping from fucking China. <laughs> Biden. Fucking uh, Christ. He wouldn't Justin even have to Trudeau. try with he, Biden. He, 
fucking punch Justin Trudeau and he'd fold like a fucking cheap suit. <laughs> Holy shit. So true. <clears throat> And uh, and I I don't know if I'll I can get kicked off of Facebook for saying this, but what's going on in Canada right now is just atrocious. Yeah, just atrocious. And I, and I'll get to the fucking forty in news. Don't you fucking folks worry. Uh, but what they've done to that uh, trucker convoy up there, uh, which was majority peaceful, uh, tried to turn into this. They tried to make it out in the media through propaganda that it was like some horrible thing. And Christ, I just saw the Daily Show did a fucking thing. And I'm like, really? Fucking really? Like, God, wh why can't we understand that? Okay, everybody bitches about, okay, we want peaceful protests. All right, so this is a fucking peaceful protest. Yeah. And it's a protest. You know, and now because these people have decided to protest peacefully, they're considered terrorists. I mean, I don't understand it. It's really uh, disappointing to see. I, somebody, I was shocked by it. If somebody wants to explain it to me um, so that I can understand it, why that it's not okay uh, for people to organize because they're upset with things that are going on. Um, and they seem to have a huge amount of support. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It the whole situation bothers me uh, right now. I'm not a fan of uh, big daddy government. Never have been a fan of big daddy government. <clears throat> um, I don't need them in my fucking bullshit. <clears throat> uh, Brett Sones, it's out fucking right. Uh, I guess so. Uh, it's just, the shit's, uh, I don't, it's blatant now. Yeah. And uh, somebody, me somebody mentioned, I think it was Jimmy Dore, who said, if Vladimir Putin did what Justin Trudeau did, to his people for doing something like that, they would have had a field day with him. <clears throat> yeah, there'd been an uprising. Yeah, it, it's just, it's it just it, it it fucking baffles me that we 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 sit we're sitting here watching Canada become an authoritarian fucking nation. Oh, it's all right, cool. Yeah, it's all in the name of fucking you know. Uh, Quote unquote science, I guess we can call it now. Can we? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anymore. I don't know. I know. Anybody <laughs> fucking call it. it changes <laughs> fucking day to day, but you're not allowed to fucking question it. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, God. God forbid you question the fucking saint that fucking they put on the TV there. What's his name? Fucking Tony. <clears throat> Tony Cuntface. I mean, uh, Fauci. Oh, that yes. guy. I but I guess you're not allowed to fucking say anything about uh, you know bad about you know stuff. Can I say he's a cunt? Is that okay? Am I allowed? I say I it. Think, but I think he's a cunt. <laughs> I, I would agree, but <laughs> uh, anywho. On to the news of the week. Sorry, everybody. I need a, <laughs> need a little rant. Uh, so, in, in summation, everyone, I don't know what the fuck is going to happen with the Facebook page. Because it's, you know, shit. Um, I don't know what to fucking tell you. I'd like to tell you that I'm going to continue doing it, but I don't know that I am. So, I'd like to. Uh, the show was going to continue. I just may move it to YouTube, which kind of kind of is a kick in the dick for me because I moved it off of YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, on with the news. <laughs> oh, I don't know what I should read tonight, Katie. 
Uh, let's see. From Newsweek.com. Owner hired ghost hunters to perform seance for haunted pet shop. A pet owner in Coventry, England, requested ghost hunters to investigate her store and hold a seance after CCTV footage showed various items flying from shelves and orbs floating around the store. 43-year-old Rebecca Harrington, who runs Purdy's Pet Shop for more than two years, said the strange activity began just two months after opening. She said she checked the store's CCTV footage after customers said they saw a shadow and felt tugging. The footage showed Harrington checked out a customer as a bag of dog treats fell off the shelf. Another clip showed a cat toy spontaneously falling off a shelf while no one was nearby. <sighs> Harrington also said a vacuum that was previously broken randomly turned on without anyone touching it. In a video, she showed an employee turn the vacuum on and off as it continued to work. It's off. The battery's dead and we can't get it off, Harrington said. <sighs> That's usually what women say when their battery's dead, too. <laughs> After reviewing the unexplainable incidents, Harrington contacted Hideous History Walking Tours to hold a seance after she said her staff was too frightened to work alone in the store. A seance is an attempt for a human to communicate with the spirit world. During a seance, participants assemble at either a round or oval table. Often a medium is chosen to guide the seance. It is believed that the, that setting the table with food can attract the spirit. Harrington recalled an instance when some customers came into the store with their German shepherds who became spooked and would not go near part of the shop. The dog's owners said they did not normally behave that way. She also said that customers were complaining about feeling tugged and that animals were reacting strangely. Staff also witnessed orbs following them around the back of the room, Mirror reported. The ghost hunters told Harrington her shop was haunted by the evil spirit of a man who used to tug on little children. <laughs> who used to reside in the building and was annoyed by the staff's presence. Since the ghost hunters were familiar customers, she said they organized the seance to raise money for, the, for charity. But she did say the experience was weird and that as one of the hunters left the room, orbs began following her and she became distressed. They think it's a male that used to live here, Harrington said. It's been a shop for the past 40 or 50 years. So we think it may have been bombed in the war as Co Coventry was bombed heavily. She also added she did not used to believe in ghosts and that she often finds herself trying to find logical explanations for some of the weird happenings. After news of the seance spread, curious passerbys have stopped by the pet store to see if they could witness some paranormal activity. Customers also ask if there will be another seance, but Harrington said if there is, she wants no part. Uh-huh. Fun times. That's interesting, I suppose. Yeah. It's Some interesting shit. shit. I mean, I don't know if it's fucking true. I don't, fucking... I don't know. Animals' involvement actually somewhat lends some credibility for me, personally. I've seen too many animals do fucking weird shit. Yeah. Oh, that's for me true. To, too. For, me to, for me to go, you know, I've been high too many times around like cats <laughs> yeah. and dogs to, to be like, oh, is something going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I don't know. Animals look to like the side of you sometimes. Like they lose eye contact and they like get distracted. And, but cats, cats are weird. So, yeah, yeah cats you're right. Creepy. They're just fucking weird creatures. Anywho, on with our next story of the evening. Uh, anybody say anything good? Oh, no. Uh, so uh, uh, I just want to shout out Dean. Nice to see you tonight. Yes, the Daily Show has become useless. Um, this guy had something to say. I don't know. Anybody wants to check that out? I'll give him. I'll give him his platform tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's good to see the the chat's been pretty pretty busy tonight, so it's good yeah. to see that. Anyway, on with our next story of the night from uh, SierraClub.org. Uh, researchers are using eDNA to track lynx, wolverines, and more. Environmental DNA in snow tracks can help conservationists find and, st and study rare carnivores. Now, this is something interesting. I'm going to give. Uh, our old uh, co-host, Matt Knapp, a shout out on this one. He 
told me about this ages ago about using DNA, environmental DNA to identify, to try to help identify Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Um, and that this was a way that it could be, it could possibly be done. Um, now, obviously if you've got nothing to compare it to, it's just a profile, a DNA profile. Right. Uh, but this, when I came across this story, I was like, this is interesting because somebody told me about this years ago. So shout out to Matt for that one. Um, the round footprints of an unknown animal led up a snow covered road in Western Montana's low, low national forest. Jesse Golding bent to inspect the tracks, then walked slowly alongside the trail, leaving Bigfoot sized snowshoe prints behind as she went. It was an unseasonably warm day for early February. The sun had ebbed away at the animal's tracks until all that was left were circular imprints. Golding took a guess at their origin, Canada Lynx. She dropped her pack, put on a fresh pair of disposable gloves, and began scooping the snow out of the tracks in a clean plastic bag. In the snow, there was an invisible breadcrumb Golding would later use to uncover the animal's identity, environmental DNA. Golding is the leader of the multi-species mesocarnivore monitoring program for the U.S. Forest Service's National Ge Genomics Center and Northern Region. For the past five years, she has been developing this novel method of using environmental DNA or eDNA found in snow tracks to identify rare forest carnivore species, including Canada lynx, wolverines, fishers, martens, and montane red foxes. These species live throughout the forests of western Montana and northern Idaho, but are characteristically elusive. The secretive nature of these animals makes it difficult for researchers to monitor how their populations are faring. <clears throat> but Golding and her colleagues can use eDNA from tracks in the snow to identify the presence of these species in order to better understand where they exist. <clears throat> the first step in being able to conserve a species is knowing what they are, Golding says, and you wouldn't be surprised how often we don't know that. The eDNA comes from the paws of an individual animal and can be in the form of skin cells or secretions from scent glands. When the animal steps in the snow, it leaves behind this genetic material. While searching for food, a lynx can lay down over five miles of tracks in one day. A wolverine, a, a wolverine can lay down even more. The constant movement of these animals in the winter means tracks are a ubiquitous part of these snowy landscapes. The process for monitoring rare carnivores has traditionally relied on visually identifying tracks in the field, and following the tracks to a place where the animal has killed prey, fed, or left scat. Kill sites and scat also contain DNA that is used to identify the species of carnivore. Another common method is to set up bait stations, which lure the animals in with already dead prey. Small wire brush, hair brushes, haired brushes will be set up near the bait to snag hair from the animal as another way to get DNA samples. But these monitoring methods can be labor intensive and time consuming. Collecting eDNA samples, however, is quick and easy, says Golding. The main concern is to make sure that each sample is collected without any contamination. This is accomplished with fresh gloves, new bags, and sterilized equipment for each sample. Once she has a bag of scooped snow from a track, the sample is kept frozen until it is ready to be run through the lab. A positive detection of a species can be determined from the tracks that are weeks old, and a single strand of DNA is all that's needed. Identifying rare carnivores from eDNA in their tracks initially seemed like a long shot to Golding. She first applied the method in Beaverhead Deer Lodge National Forest, where Canada lynx were not known to be found. But in 2018, a private citizen ca had captured a picture on a remote sensing camera, and the photo looked curiously like a lynx. The ambiguous picture inspired the first test to see that if the eDNA method could help confirm what the camera couldn't. Not knowing how much snow would be needed to find eDNA, Golding remembers collecting many gallons of it from the camera's trap location and lugging it from the forest. To Golding's surprise, somewhere in those gallons of snow was eDNA from a lynx. It was a game changer. Canada lynx are listed as threatened with extinction under the Endangered Species Act. This means that wherever they are found, land managers are required to consider how decisions will impact the species, explains Scott Jackson, the U.S. Forest Service. Ugh, services national carnivore program leader 
To be able to hunt, reproduce, and survive, lynx require diverse forests with young and old stands of trees. But good lynx habitat can easily be spoiled by uniform decision, uniform decisions about forest management, such as where to log or conduct prescribed burns. The more we know about which species may live on this piece of ground, the more informed our management decisions will be, Jackson says. Uh, environmental de uh, de de No, I went skipped ahead. Despite how important this fundamental data is, it is often lacking for these species in their Rocky Mountain ranges. But as climate change continues to alter the habitat that these rare species depend on, it will be imperative to know as much as possible about their whereabouts and how healthy their populations are. Environmental DNA can make gathering that information a more efficient process, says Betsy Herman, the Planning and Resources Staff Officer for Beaverhead Deer Lodge National Forest. Because collecting snow tracks is so simple, Herman has involved people in her department other than researchers to help with the efforts. Now when U.S. Forest Service law enforcement officers and recreation specialists come across supposed rare carnivore tracks, they are trained to collect it. More people involved in the monitoring process has meant covering more ground, Herman says. Golding would like to see this method of wildlife monitoring someday expanded to a citizen science effort. Visually identifying tracks in the snow can be difficult or impossible, Golding explains. But eDNA is a powerful tool for identifying where the mountain's most mysterious species have been out walking. I always tell my team, if you have any doubt, just scoop the snow, Golding says. <clears throat> That's an, that's an interesting one. Uh, I I really, I like that they're doing that. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, you know, A, it's it's good. It's good to be able to help conserve that animal or for conservation for the lynx. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, like I was saying in the beginning, uh, this is something that Matt had introduced to me as a, a way to look for Bigfoot DNA at supposed sighting locations and i think it's not a bad fucking idea yeah i think it's really exciting there's a lot of possibility there and i'm glad to be seeing the science used you know i mean it is a fairly new technology so it's nice to see it being used and hopefully normalized and no you know, that's good very cool phil. good to see phil in the chat phil phil thinks climate change is going to help you won. You won, Phil. I mean, I don't know. Other people say different. That's a, that's that's a fucking uh, a debate I'm not fucking even getting into. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> it's, one, it's one I don't want to have. Nope. <laughs> uh, anywho, on to our next story of the evening. Uh, from M-C-A-L-L, McCall.com. Uh, UFOs, what the hell? UFOs in the Lehigh Valley, Northampton's community college, offering two classes for adults yearning for learning that's out of this world. Ooh, such a nice title. Um, Kathleen B. Kovalt's interest in extraterrestrial life started over two decades ago when she and her husband moved to the Hudson Valley in New York, not knowing it was a UFO hotspot. We started meeting people who had stories, said Kovalt during a phone interview earlier this month. I have a background in counseling and people just like to tell me stuff. So they were talking to me and I believed them. I believed that they had a real experience that they could not understand. They joined a community group where residents would gather to share their experiences and with unidentified flying objects and other phenomena. Over 20 years ago, I knew something definite was going on, Kovalt said. And so I've always been open to it, and I've had little minor experiences. But the big thing for me is the people, hearing the people express the real emotion, what has happened to them. This spring, Cobalt is offering two online classes through Northampton Community College for adults interested in learning more government UFO disclosures, increased exception in acceptance of the phenomena, and possible religious connections to the sightings. The class is the rainbow body. Could it be related to the UFO UAP phenomena and UFOs UAPs current disclosure efforts and scientific investigation scientific investigations begins February 23rd and April 5th respectively. There just seems 
to be more interest this semester than past semesters, Koval said, noting she's been teaching the course for two years. I attribute that it's just in the news more and people are taking it more seriously. She pointed to the National Defense Authorization Act signed into law by President Joe Biden in December. It includes the establishment of office, organizational structure, and authorities to address unidentified aerial phenomena. This office will centralize all the different places within the Department of Defense, and all the intelligence communities will send their information to this one centralized office, she explained. That's always worked out really well in government. (laughs) So this is a huge deal. It's historic because the government is saying this is an important issue, that we're going to fund it, and we're going to centralize and coordinate the reporting of it. Mainstream scientists are also starting to take interest, she said. Researchers at Harvard University, led by physicist Avi Loeb, uh, last year launched the Galileo Project to systematically, scientifically, and transparently look for potential evidence of extraterrestrial technological equipment. Yeah, he's the dude that really thinks that the... uh, that that Uma Muma fucking uh, asteroid slash comet yeah. thing was actually a fucking a craft. Spacecraft, sort. yeah. Yeah, he said that it, it it reacted very, very odd when it went around the sun. Um, reports of unidentified flying objects are, as the federal government has deemed them, unidentified aerial phenomena have been logged across Pennsylvania and the Lehigh Valley for decades. Uh, UFO researchers and enthusiasts across the Commonwealth have recorded more than 3,500 sightings since 1947. The region's UFO sightings have made national television. In October, a video of strange lights in the sky over East Stroudsburg, shot by Michael Michael Lugo, was featured on the second season of Travel Channel's The Osbournes Want to Believe a reality show focused on turning skeptics Ozzy and Sharon Osbourne into believers. I'm down. <laughs> I'm down. The mush mouth fucking Ozzy. Let's oh, go. Geez. But so far this year, no Pennsylvania sightings have been logged with the National UFO Reporting Center. More and more people seem to be open to the possibility of extraterrestrial life. Results of a Pew Research Center survey released in June show about two-thirds of Americans say their best guess is that intelligent life exists on other planets. Similarly, a July Gallup poll found four in ten Americans now think some UFOs that people have spotted have been alien spacecraft visiting Earth from other planets or galaxies. As belief in UFOs becomes more commonplace, Cobalt's online classes have garnered students across Students from across the country, she said, including Ohio, Colorado, and California. Using her research background from earning her doctorate in educational psychology and master's degree in psychological counseling, coupled with her her intuitive nature, that helps a lot. She hopes to help boost the legitimacy of the field of study. It's all about curiosity and attempting to understand new perspectives. We're coming to this point that we kind of need to wake up, that the world is way different than we ever thought. And that there really are UFOs, unidentified flying objects. There really are other dimensions with beings. Are we going Dr. Johnson on this one? Conscious beings that live there that we can communicate with, she said. I want to help people open to this possibility, start thinking about it in a different way and being prepared. Because I think this is coming. Now, I joke. I love shit about the multiverse. If there was a fucking multiverse, I'd be down tomorrow. <laughs> I'm fucking totally down. Uh, Jesus Christ. Fucking fill on a fucking comment fucking spree over here. Jesus. What the fuck happened? He's going God, off, did, man. They touch, a, they touch a fucking vein? <laughs> yeah, she's a psychologist, Phil. She's, uh, they get degrees, uh, apparently, and can be completely fucking wacko. Oh, that's interesting that she's a psychologist <laughs> teaching that class. Yeah. Hmm. Teaching class on UFOs. Fucking out of it's out of this world, Katie. It's fucking out of this world. Indeed it is. Oh, fucking people. I don't even fucking know anymore. Uh from SeattleTimes.com. Pacific Northwest set episode of Mysterious Creatures airs on Animal Planet this weekend. 
Well, the title of the new Animal Planet series, Mir- Mysterious Creatures with Forest Galante, may bring to mind a past show like Finding Bigfoot, who, uh, alas, was never found. Galante hopes viewers will not see the title and think this show is something akin to Snipe Hunt, the series. It's not the title I would have chosen, Galante said in a recent phone interview about Mysterious Creatures. It's a catchy title. I would have chosen something a bit more about human wildlife conflict. The latest episode of Mysterious Creatures airing on ni- at 9 p.m. February 26 on Animal Planet is devoted to the Pacific Northwest lake monsters. Originally, we were looking at the Ogopogo, which is in British Columbia, but Canada was close to Americans for travel due to COVID-19. And the next most well-known was this Lake Chelan Dragon, Galante said. In many ways, Mysterious Creatures is an extension of Galante's 2018 to 2019 Animal Planet show, Extinct or Alive, where the wildlife biologist attempted to track down animals thought to be extinct. We're attempting to resolve dispute and expose extinction before it happens, he said. Whether that's damming of waterways in the Pacific Northwest or the misidentifying of creatures in South America or direct human wildlife conflict in Africa. Ah, Excuse me. This is the message that I'm trying to convey. There are non-lethal mitigation methods to human wildlife conflict that don't result in extinction. It's fighting extinction before it takes hold. With his wife, zoologist Jessica Summerfield, and two-year-old son Rhodes along for the survey, Galante visited Lake Chalin, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that rightly, or Kalen, I don't know if I can know, in early June 2021 to search for signs of the supposed Loch Ness monster-like beast that stems from Native American legends. An 1892 sighting and the aftermath of a 1945 tragedy when a school bus, bus plunged into the lake killing 15 children. Galante's investigation led the team to the Columbia River near the Dallas or near the Dallas, Oregon. Okay. The Dales. I don't know. Oh, you fucking pronounce that. As a wildlife biologist who focuses on extinction and combating extinction, I looked for stories that I felt were impactful to that message, including the damming of the waterways of the Pacific Northwest, Galante said. Although nothing is an immediate risk of extinction with regard to the waterways in the Pacific Northwest, the accumulation of that problem is quite large. So I wanted a story that was engaging and fun and exciting, but also gave some exposure to the fact that the waterways have changed. The biology and the ecology of the wildlife in the Pacific Northwest has changed with it. Much of the problem is man-made and attributed to our dams, Galante continued. Western influence has actually done quite a lot of damage, he said. Things like the sturgeon that at one point in time should have been rampant throughout the Pacific Northwest and all the fresh waterways connected to the ocean are now cut off from those waterways by man-made dams. Although other rumored mysterious creatures from the Pacific Northwest get mentioned at the top of the hour-long episode, Galante said he did not leave the region inclined to revisit any of them if mysterious creatures gets renewed for a second season. At least not any of the lake monsters, he said. I truly believe that the giant white sturgeon account for what people are seeing and misidentifying throughout the region. Mystery creature solved, it seems. Bum, bum, bum. I, I, I like those types of shows uh, when they're honest. Yeah, I'd say that sounds uh, like it has potential. Like it might not be that bad. Right. It's, it's definitely um, like I like that uh, Jeremy Wade guy. Yes, the I river, love river him. Monster. Yeah, Jeremy Wade's fucking great. I'm uh, Jeremy Wade, and this is River Monsters. Yeah, and fucking dude's great. I fucking, <laughs> He's excellent. Wa- I could watch him for fucking 24 hours in a row. Oh, yeah. I, the dude's just fucking always out fucking catching some weird-ass fish. He looks a <clears> lot <throat> like my dad, actually. Maybe that's why I like him. He's like the British version of my dad. <laughs> that's funny. Ah. Uh. What the fuck is he fucking Phil talking about now? Cadborosaurus, nicknamed Caddy by journalist Archie Willis. I think Wills that's one of the beasts serp- they talked sea- about in there. Yeah, sea serpent in the folklore regions of the Pacific Coast. Uh-huh. Let's see. Cow butts are a huge source of swamp gas. Dean Cooper. Great. Thanks, <laughs> Dean. I always like little snippets of information. Uh, my favorite thing in the world, everybody, you should all know this, is the uh, Bigfoot factoids that were on Finding Bigfoot. 
because yeah. if there's anything that we have about Bigfoot, it's facts. Yeah. Oh, no, no. They're factoids, Chris. Come on. Uh, oh, 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 oh. That's how we get away with it. Yes, indeed. Factoids. Yeah. It's I like see. fake news. I see. Uh, from slashfilm.com. Nope. Trailer breakdown. We're not saying it's aliens, but... Have you seen the trailer for this fucking thing? No, Katie, you no, have not. I have not. Uh, I okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna probably get beat up for this. I have not yet watched a fucking Jordan Peele movie, and I should have by now. Uh, but I saw the trailer for this. Nope, and it looks fucking good. Um, the long awaited trailer for Nope. Director Jordan Peele's next horror movie has finally dropped, and it's as picturesque as it is confounding. In a good way, of course. Coupled with Peele's reputation for injecting a fresh perspective into the horror genre, the intentionally vague and cryptic marketing surrounding Nope has helped to build interest and speculation concerning Peele's next creepy tale. Following the unprecedented success and critical reception of Get Out and Us, Nope will be Peele's third feature film. But even with the added help of the trailer, much of the plot, uh, much of the plot of still, that was written bad. Much of the plot still remains a mystery. We're here to break the trailer down and try to parse whatever details we can. Luckily, there's plenty to dig into. The Nope trailer begins with a clip of the first motion picture ever made, a two-second clip of a man riding a horse. As a fun fact, the first motion was indeed a brief clip of a man riding a horse, though there is no information about the rider's identity beyond the fact that he was presumably a black man. It's certainly interesting that Peel would draw and build upon this historical fact to build his story, similar to how he used the 1986 Hands Across America fundraising event as the inspiration for us and its chilling imagery. Check out the original motion picture photographs created by Edward Muybridge in 1878, and originally animated using devices like the Praxinoscope below. The Nope trailer then cuts to Kiki Palmer's character performing in front of a green screen alongside a live horse, and Daniel Kuluya, who played the lead role in Get Out, describing the horse rider in the clip as a black man who is also her great-great-grandfather. But she is corrected by a very tired and exasperated-looking Daniel Kaluuya, who tells her to add another great, Palma's character enthusiastically adds another great and continues her spiel before an audience of <clears throat> cameramen and film crew. Horses are also present throughout the trailer, and it seems that the primary setting of Nope will be the fictional Haywood Ranch, which Palmer, Palmer's character describes as being the home to the only black horse trainers in Hollywood. Notably, Kaluuya, Kaluuya's character resembles the unnamed horse rider in the clip, they're both accompanied by a black horse, and both are wearing hats with the front brim. Peel's inventive use of racism itself as the primary antagonist of Get Out was praised by critics and audiences alike. In his second film, Us, Peel cast a black family as the primary protagonist of the film, but race did not play an explicit role in the, in the story. In an interview with The Guardian, he said that Us was very intentionally not about race. Now, in Nope, it appears as though race will come into play to some degree, as evidenced by the words of Palmer's character at the start of the trailer. I also noticed the optics of the film crew being predominantly white and male, while the people being recorded, Palmer and Kaluuya, are black. I can't help thinking this was an intentional juxtaposition, though to what end I can't yet decipher. It could be nothing. It could be commentary on the way mainstream media still expects and rewards exaggerated characters of non-white racial identity from people of color at the expense of their personhood and individuality. Who knows? There's also the fact that the song in the trailer is Fingertips, which is about putting on a show and hyping up the crowd. Lending further credence to my theory about the com modification of racial identity and maybe other things playing a role, ugh, maybe other things, playing a role are the abundance of the creepy, flailing arm tube things. You know, the t kind typically used by used car dealerships and retail businesses when they want to catch your attention. The terrifying tube creatures, also called sky dancers, are undoubtedly linked to commercialization and advertisement. They could also be a hint at Nope's potential movie monsters, which many suspect will be aliens. 
<clears throat> More references to extraterrestrials and threats from the sky are sprinkled throughout the trailer. People and cameras looking towards the sky, the big cloud that serves as a focal point in the film's promotional poster, and of course the nod to Steven Spielberg's E.T. A child character is seen preparing to fist bump the hand of some person or creature with charred-looking skin under the table. Do they just want to phone home, or do they want something more sinister? Another potential reference is this shot of the ranch's main house in the trailer, which closely resembles the house in the middle of nowhere from the cartoon Courage the Cowardly Dog. This could just be childhood nostalgia talking, but given other homages present in the trailer, there's a chance it was a conscious source of inspiration. In Courage, strange things constantly plague the house and inhabitants, and that certainly seems to be what's going on in Nope. I mean, just look at what happened to this horse that appears to be upside down and lodged in headfirst in a vehicle. Uh huh. <clears throat> a popular theory concerning the film's plot and title is that Nope is actually an acronym for Not of Planet Earth. Although Peel has not yet to confirm or deny this theory, it's not out of the realm of possibility. There's also the also, the fact that the film's vague synopsis contains the question, what's a bad miracle? Miracles are often referred to as blessings from above. And what is above us? The sky, the galaxy, space. It's all coming together when you think about it. Nope was also memorably uttered in last year's Candyman, which was written and produced by Peel and directed by Nia DaCosta. In a scene poking fun at how characters in horror movies always make the terrible decision to wander into creepy dark basements, Tayona Paris's character encounters a doorway leading to a dark, creepy basement and says, nope, before slamming the door shut again. <clears throat> There's no nope in the nope trailer, but Kiki Palmer does use the variation na-na-na as she encounters the ominous phenomena. There are several moments in the nope trailer that appear to depict changes in the atmosphere with respect to wind and air. Large gusts of wind that carry dust and dirt with them are seen knocking over and sweeping up the film's characters. Additionally, the wacky, waving, flailing, inflatable arm tube men suddenly deflate at two different points in the trailer, indicating either an electricity blackout of some kind or of ugh, some kind of change or some kind of change the air change in the air that previously inflated them. Could these shifts apparent shifts in the wind be the work of aliens? Maybe, probably. I mean, Kiki Palmer's character is also snatched up into what looks like both a Twister reference and an alien abduction of sorts. I think I'm just going to stop there because this just keeps going on and on and on and on. <laughs> it sounds interesting. Yeah, I like I said, I have not yet seen Get Out or Us. Um, I had intended to see both of them, and I've seen neither. Um, I'd be very interested in... Uh, to check this one out this one looks really cool and the 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 stuff that he's putting out er everybody's raving about it i haven't heard much about the candy man movie which he wrote yeah i had um, wanted to see that but i never did yeah well i watched candy man back in the fucking 90s yeah yeah I mean, it was a fucking cool horror movie back then um i definitely i definitely like to check the the new one out um but I just get fucking wrapped up in watching fucking shit. Like that right. new show, the Peace, fucking Peacemaker on fucking HBO. You, just, you know, that's the shit that just fucking grabs you. Grabs you right by the fucking cockles. Just <laughs> drags you right down for fucking eight episodes. Because you just can't stop. <clears throat> He's got a pet eagle, Katie. It's named Eagly. <laughs> Eagly? <laughs> Eagly. That's cute. No, it is. <laughs> no, really, it is. <laughs> it's adorable, actually. Fucking absolutely adorable. All right. Our next story of the night. Let's see what we got here. From the travelchannel.com. They bought a ghost town, but they didn't expect the ghosts. <clears throat> One family's dream of owning a sprawling Montana guest ranch turns into a nightmare. When they discover it comes with more than just horses and history. This one may frighten even the Duttons on the outskirts of An Anaconda, Montana. Sits Gunslinger Gulch. Sprawling ghost town and guest ranch made up of various historic abandoned buildings salvaged from across the state. When the Broussard family answered the beckoning call of a new life in big sky country. 
an opportunity to own this unique 52 acre property they got more than they bargained for they soon discovered the ranch offered anything but the serene montana lifestyle they were seeking relentless menacing supernatural activity has plagued the family since day one leaving them terrified and desperate for answers are they trying to create a new skinwalker ranch maybe is that what's going on here i mean i'm just like speculating well, but this it, seems it is, it's fascinating seems... already that they said that it's filled with abandoned buildings from other locations so they literally transported whole buildings and plopped them on 52 acres 52 acres really isn't that big of a plot of land right so that is that is actually kind of creepy. I, I think mean, it's creepy, but I don't know if it's anyway. No. Uh, after more than a year of paranormal attacks, including unexplained scratches, apparitions, disembodied voices, and poltergeist activity, Karen and her family, daughter Chloe, twenty, and sons Cameron, twenty-one, and Colby, fifteen, somebody's got a fucking pension for C names, <laughs> are distraught and in dire need of help. Paranormal investigator Tim Wood and paranormal researcher Sapphire Sinaldo come to their aid and soon discover the entire town has a disturbingly dark history and an oppressive energy is taking over. Facing a particularly ominous situation, they call in backup psychic medium Sarah Lemos, who is immediately affected by negative forces. Why wouldn't she be? Of course she is. And Wood's longtime friend and fellow investigator Scott D. Lala. The team's extensive investigation uncovers a heinous unsolved murder, mysterious open ground pits, bone findings, alarming EVPs, startling physical attacks, and most frightening, that an evil entity, entity may have attached itself to a family member. They're led on a windy, eerie hunt beyond Gunslinger Gulch and into the towns of Anaconda and nearby Butte to a historic brothel and abandoned house rife with their own merciless history. The team discovers these buildings have uncanny ties back to the ranch and the Broussards. As Tim and Sapphire work to get closer to the truth behind the haunting, the activity only goes stronger and more diabolical, making even the hunters feel hunted. The investigation of Gunslinger Gulch has become a battle of wills. This series is going to hook you until the very end, said Matthew Butler, general manager of Travel Channel and Paranormal Streaming Content. Of course he did. <laughs> told across six episodes and it's incre it's an incredibly complex paranormal investigation and dark mystery that starts out as one thing and becomes something even bigger all while transporting viewers to a real guest ranch in the heart of beautiful man montana and that goes through the fucking the team and the the episodes all the episodes that they're gonna have uh, the, 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 yeah thank you phil how can a town have a dark history when it's not a real town? Thank you, yeah. Phil. Thank you. Jesus fucking Christ, people. I know, I, a lot of leaps there. I just... The ghost hunting shows, just fucking stop it. Just fucking stop. It's, it's not... You're not doing, any, you're not doing yourself any favors. Yeah. In my opinion. You're not doing yourself any fucking favors. You know, you want to be a ghost hunter. That's all fine and dandy. Don't put it on TV. You look fucking foolish. You look fucking goddamn foolish. Yeah, that's super disingenuous to act like that's a ghost town when you probably just went and found a bunch of buildings that were free if you paid to have them transported and you just created your own little ghost town. Like, get out of here. Well, we dragged the energy with us. Katie. Oh, yeah. They followed us. We didn't cross any rivers. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes all the difference. You're right. No, no water in the United rivers. States. <laughs> <laughs> no bridges either. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't understand this fucking shit. I've never have. But, uh, you know, hey, again, I say this over and over and over. I want to believe. I want to believe. I want to find. I want something out there to show me that that I'm not crazy and wanting to believe. But I haven't seen it yet. You know, I 
I've yet to see that thing that makes me go, I'm a hundred percent in. Yeah. hundred percent. I don't, these people, it's, this is a hundred percent proof. <laughs> is it? Like, I look at the fucking, you know, people say that the fucking Patty film is a hundred percent proof. Is it? It's not. Is the, the, some people say that the Freeman film, it, is it? I don't know. I think there's too much speculation concerning all of it. And yeah. there's too many questions when it comes to every single one of these fucking videos and or pictures and or stories and or fucking whatever. You know, it, when someone says they encountered something, I don't know. Did they? It's quite possible. But I don't know. And uh, Phil is correct. A video is never 100% proof. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if there's anything, if we could ever get to a point that it is, you know, maybe we, maybe there's a, there's a point where, you know, and we don't know, we don't know where technology is going. Maybe we'll come to a point in time where they, they do something to video where they can definitely tell shit. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not a fucking expert. I don't know where uh, the science of video technology is going. I don't fucking know. I, I'd like to watch those slow-mo videos that those guys do from Great Britain. Those are pretty fun. You know, but I don't understand how cameras work or how they're going to be working in the future. Or how... Well, that's the thing is camera technology has technically kind of changed. I mean, I know how a film camera works. It's not really the same concept with all this digital shit. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of things. I don't know. Phil probably know. He fucking knows that shit. He can oh, explain yeah, it. Yeah, I'm sure. Maybe we, Phil, maybe we can have you on to explain to us camera technology. Yeah, I would enjoy it. It be a very interesting, informative show about camera technology. Phil, let's make this as boring as fuck. Just, I want to lose... At least half of my audience. <laughs> just, <laughs> just drive them away. Uh, anywho, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Uh, it was pretty busy tonight. I got to admit. Yeah, it was, that was it was, lovely. It was, busy. It, was, it was nice to see everybody in the. There was not a lot of people in the chat, uh, but. Um, Seemed like we had a, a good amount of people listening for the course of the show. So, um, <clears throat> thanks to Phil and uh, Dean for showing up. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely showed up. Uh, this has been the 40 and Slip episode 203. The Russians are coming. They're fucking coming. Old Putin. I, I just want to see him. I'm dead serious. Fucking a big scepter in his hand fucking shirtless on the back of a fucking horse. Actually, you know what, Putin? I know you fucking got a unicorn somewhere over there hidden away. Just ride <laughs> that fucker into battle. Just fucking right in front of your troops, you crazy fucking Russian son of a bitch. Uh, and until next week, uh, when maybe we'll have a, a fill polling, maybe not. Maybe we'll just do a normal show. I don't know. Um, when we'll be back to bring you uh, more 40 in news of a new week. Until that time, see ya!